Když 9, prostor Čížova, hlasím na ručení státní hranice. For 38 years, the River Tyre was not the only border between Austria and Czechoslovakia. Like a great gulf, the Iron Curtain divided the valley into east and west. Almost daily, there were alarm signals at the border, mostly caused by stags and wild boars, who didn't know that their homeland had been divided. There were countless human tragedies in that no man's land. Yet, strange though it may seem, the Iron Curtain was the reason this jewel of nature has survived, the valley at the border. The tyre has carved a deep gorge into the rugged landscape. This part of the Tyre Valley can look back on a turbulent history. Following the end of the First World War, the border between Austria and the Czech Republic split the river down the middle. A few years after the Second World War, the river became the symbol of a divided Europe. One of its banks belonged to the West, while the other, soon to be separated by the Iron Curtain, to the east. The Czech borders were declared a no man's land. Only soldiers and a few civil servants were allowed to set foot on them. Less than two years after the fall of the Iron Curtain, the Czech part of this no man's land between Frein and Snaim became a national park, the Narodny Park Podi. Nine years later, on January the 1st, 2000, Austria also declared approximately 57 kilometers of this picturesque river valley a national park. This is no ordinary national park. Crossing political borders, it unites east and west, but north and south also meet here. At the edges of the valley, cool, damp Atlantic air mixes with a dry Pannonian climate. Gentle slopes and steep walls of rock mark this landscape, creating ideal habitat for a variety of plants and animals in a very small area. In puddles and ponds, grey herons go fishing. They're protected all year round in this remote valley. But the most fascinating creature in these puddles, covered by duckweed, is a rather inconspicuous animal. It's the caterpillar of a moth called the small china mark. It builds its case from the duckweed that grows here in abundance. It's a harmless relation of the European corn earworm, a parasite that destroys large quantities of maize the world over. But these caterpillars feed only on duckweed. They prevent the puddles from becoming overgrown. Protected by this thin layer of duckweed, the caterpillar has to survive the winter. Autumn is the best time of year in this border valley. On fine days, oak trees gleam gold in the sunshine.
In oak and beech forests, there is an abundance of food for European wild boars. They are the most numerous mammals on both sides of the river. Huge numbers of sows and piglets scour the forest for food. Not only do they eat acorns and beech mast, but their sensitive snouts also sniff out the larvae of insects, preventing parasites from damaging the woodland. The wild boar is a true landscape gardener. It ploughs up the ground and buries seeds, thus regenerating the forest. They are very sociable animals, unless they have just farrowed. After substantial meals, they can be seen grooming each other. They use their teeth to comb each other's bristles. The males are loners all year round. Only now, during their breeding season, will they approach sows. Soon, the land will be covered in a hard frost, although for its height above sea level, the Tyre Valley is one of the warmest regions in Austria and the Czech Republic. The rising damp from the river and constant wind create bizarre ice formations, the first melancholy heralds of winter. The sloughs and puddles are frozen now. The China Mark's caterpillars are firmly locked into the ice. But how can a caterpillar survive frost and ice without damage? It's December. A remarkable spectacle unfolds in the tributaries of the Tyre. Male trout are battling for the right to mate. The rivals fight bitterly. They can do each other serious harm. Winners and losers often die after just a few days. Unimpressed by all this, the females, meanwhile, create a spawning ground in the bed of the brook. A pregnant female carries up to a thousand eggs, laying them either all at once or in several batches. The male gets very close to the female to fertilize them as soon as they're laid. Females make more than one nest, mating with different males. Then they try to cover their new spawning ground. The eggs are carried off by the current. Before they reach a well-aired gravelly place where the eggs will hatch into young fish, they have to face many dangers. These small trout have survived their first year. They now devour this year's new generation. Greedily, they eat the eggs and spit out the shells, which are hard to digest. Because of the tire's fluctuating water level, many of the eggs are carried into shallow water, poor in oxygen, or even washed ashore. They die. Gradually, winter takes an icy grip on the country. Now, in deep midwinter, the peculiarity of the Tyre Valley's climate becomes apparent. Blizzards are a rarity. 
Well protected by the Alps far off to the west, as well as the Waldviertel's chains of hills, and supplied with dry air by the remnants of the Pannonian climate, this border valley has among the lowest precipitation in both Austria and the Czech Republic. Snow doesn't usually survive for more than a few days. Consequently, young deer and stags find enough food even during the winter. The herd isn't led by a stag, but by an experienced hind. Females not only provide safety, they also raise the alarm when danger is afoot. Yet they have little to fear in this national park. On the Czech side of the river, valley animals are no longer persecuted, and even in the Austrian part of the park, hunting is restricted. There are years, though, when even the river freezes. If the temperature suddenly rises, the whole valley reverberates with the crackling of the icy stream. However, the spectacle rarely lasts for long. Afterwards, the rapidly rising water resumes its usual course. The ice becomes brittle, and eventually the increasing power of the sun, herald of spring, melts it completely. Every year, a minor miracle occurs in the puddles covered by duckweed. The caterpillars of the China Mark have survived the frosty winter. They can control the water content of their bodies, preventing the ice from bursting their cells. Released by the ice, the caterpillar rises to the surface and collects small air bubbles. It needs this air supply on its back in order to breathe underwater. Some birds, like the dipper, have spent the winter by the river. Now, all the other songbirds return. The field fair settled in this border valley only a few years ago. Originally, it came from far to the north, but within the past decades, it has conquered new habitats. Tirelessly, the parents take turns in feeding the fledglings with worms and insects and removing all the droppings. There is a constant coming and going at the nest. The chick's droppings are sealed into a skin to keep the nest clean. But not all the chicks observe the rules. The banks of the little streams that feed the tyre now become a sea of flowers. In early spring, enough light reaches the forest floor for wood anemone, spring pea and many other small flowers to produce their seeds in a very short time. One shy inhabitant of the river has begun to reconquer its home in recent years, the European otter. For centuries, this elegant animal was hunted as a pest and wiped out in Austria, though there was absolutely nothing to justify the persecution. A large number of monasteries and aristocratic houses even had otter on the menu at times of fasting. As a water animal, it was considered the next best thing to fish. Now, even in small tributaries of the tyre, there are traces of these skilled hunters. 
Normally they would hunt near their holts, but if there isn't enough food, European otters can cover distances of up to 30 kilometers a night to find it. These expeditions must be successful because a fully grown otter requires about a kilo of fish per day. However, otters don't feed only on fish. In spring, they sometimes raid the nests of ducks and other water birds. Later in the year, they avidly pursue muskrats and meadow voles. This remote national park has provided them with a new home. Every morning now, the sun becomes stronger. The mother sows have gathered their young and moved from the protection of the undergrowth to the edge of the forest. Gradually, the young wild boars are losing their characteristic markings. In the meadows, they play games involving fighting and running, imitating the actions of their parents. There's also a lot going on in the puddles and sloughs, wherever water has collected during the winter. Bizarre creatures like little dragons seek mates in still waters. A male common newt tries to win over the female of his choice. First, the male samples her scent to find out if she is in the right mood. At present, she seems unimpressed by the male's endeavours. But then he begins his mating ritual. With the tip of his tail, he fans intoxicating scents in her direction. Now the female follows her seducer. As soon as she touches the tip of his tail with her mouth, the male delivers a packet of sperm. He now moves ahead by a body length and keeps still. As if in a trance, the female follows. Her cloaca remains exactly above the sperm and absorbs it. During the next few days, the eggs are fertilized inside the female's body. Using her back legs, she then begins to shape the leaves of the water plants, making a place to lay an egg. During the next two weeks, she will lay up to 300 eggs, only to disappear afterwards into the scrub on the banks, just like the male. At the water surface, a fascinating metamorphosis has occurred. The inconspicuous caterpillar of the China mark has turned into a magnificent moth. In the early hours of the morning, swathes of fog rise from the river to the steep ridges of the valley. High up, a young badger ventures out of its set. 
This is a very young, adventurous animal, exploring its immediate surroundings. As a rule, mothers see to it that none of their youngsters leave the set on their own. The small animal is still very shaky on its legs. After its adventure, it quickly disappears back into the parental set. It's May. The border valley now reflects an enormous variety of colours. Rare flowers like the burning bush and colourful irises stand in full bloom at the edges of the dry forest. Wherever limestone comes close to the surface, innumerable orchids grow. In the trees on the river banks, caterpillars of the purple emperor mercilessly attack the lush greenery. Their dangerous looking antlers are not meant for defense, they're just one of nature's whims. Without pausing, they eat leaf after leaf until only shreds remain. Eventually, the caterpillars eat so much that their skin becomes too small. Then, quite literally, they burst. A caterpillar molts four times during its short life. After a short period of rest, it once again pursues the only purpose of its existence, eating. On the riverbank, the forest's most timid inhabitant is on the lookout for food, the black stork. About four to six pairs breed in the national park every year, most of them in the Czech Republic. The chick's white plumage already reveals their black feathers. Storks usually build their nests high up in oak trees or beaches. Sometimes they take over the nests of birds of prey. In rare cases, they also breed in steep, rocky places. While one parent guards the nest, the other ventures out to seek food. Black storks are particularly elegant flyers. They need unspoilt forests and riverbanks where they can hunt for fish and frogs without being disturbed. If they are disturbed, the parents often abandon the nest and the fledglings may die. Fish are the main item on the menu of black storks in the Tyre Valley, but they don't refuse insects and mice. If there is an abundance of mice, their fledglings will grow even more rapidly on such a rich diet. Now, in early summer, the young storks seem to be irritated by their down. The parents help their fledglings to free themselves of the covering that kept them warm as chicks. Just occasionally, all the fledglings in a nest of black storks survive. If a chick dies, however, its parents no longer recognize it as their offspring. They simply eat it. Stork parents don't return to their nests with any individual fish they catch. Usually, they catch several, which they swallow head first. With some effort, these skilled fishermen can even engulf large fish 20 centimeters long. If a stork has been successful in its fishing, it returns to its hungry chicks as soon as possible. If there are only a few fish in the river, and if there's no food to be found in the surrounding meadows, Black storks often fly more than 10 kilometers from their nests while looking for food. The chicks await their parents' return with great excitement. They beg for food by pecking at the parental beak. Eventually, their father produces two fish. As the chicks pounce on the prey, there's no thought of brotherly sharing. Only the strong will survive in this family.
The wailing calls of the chicks who haven't been fed send their father off fishing again. On hot summer days, the river exudes a particular magic. At the entrance to the national park, veils of mist rise over the water in the morning. But the reason for this is anything but enchanting. Just a few meters outside the national park, a huge dam interrupts the river's natural flow. Ever since the 1930s, 160 million cubic meters of water have been stored behind this 60 meter high dam. When necessary, the water is released. When the first plans were drawn up, this dam near Freyn was the largest of its day. Twice a day, when the demand for electricity peaks, a torrent emerges from the artificial lake and pours into the national park. Within a few minutes, the flood rises dramatically. In the river's wider sections, the water spreads out, but in narrow places, the level rises by about a meter. The gentle Tyre has turned into a wild mountain river. 30 to 40 times the usual amount of one cubic meter per second now rushes down the river bed. It's as though the valley were drowned twice a day. This has fatal consequences for all life in the valley. Twice a day, the riverbed is churned up. Natural floods would cause this only once or twice a year. Many fish species can't resist these floods and are simply washed away. To stone loach and gudgeon, this is a never-ending struggle for survival. The fish have to find a new place to live every day. To make matters worse, the water from this deep artificial lake is ice cold. All of these factors have completely changed the river over the past decades. Water which was once the home of barbell and even carp has now turned into a swift river that is home to brown trout. Further downriver, in quieter places, the Tyre's riverbed is so solid that fish eggs are simply washed away or die smothered in silt. The floods can't harm the abundance of flowers on the shallow banks. They have long since adapted to the daily routine. This sumptuous carpet of flowers is called butterfly meadow by the locals. Over long stretches, fragrant shining meadows border the river. Yet, once or twice a year, this colourful splendour has to die in order to be revived the following year. If the meadows weren't mown on a regular basis, bushes and shrubs would soon replace the colourful flowers. High above the ground, the last stage of a fascinating metamorphosis happens in the twigs of the trees. A green cocoon has turned into a butterfly. The Purple Emperor's proboscis is still in two parts, which it can assemble into its most important tool only with great difficulty. Unlike other butterflies, the Purple Emperor does not feed on the nectar of flowers, but actually sucks the sap of trees and gathers honeydew from greenfly and other animals. It takes about 15 minutes for the butterfly to pump enough body fluid into the veins of its wings to spread them fully.
the nestling black storks are also about to take flight. They use each gust of wind to try out their wings. One of them has already succeeded in leaving the nest. In a small brook, it goes fishing for the first time alone. Storks don't have to learn to fly. They have an inborn ability to soar on thermal currents. All the chicks have to do is to exercise their muscles to be strong enough for the long trip to Africa. And they have to find and catch their own prey. Small common newts have hatched in the warm marshes bathed in sunlight. On some of them the gill plumes are still clearly visible, though most have already lost them. Now the young newts make their way ashore. Unlike their parents who venture only a few meters from the pool, the young newts wander far and wide. In their search for a suitable pool, they can travel up to two kilometers, but only very few of them survive. Many small brooks, like the Tyre in miniature, meander through smaller valleys. Traces of wild boar and red deer are regularly found on their banks. At this time of year, though, these rulers of the forest are hardly ever seen. This is when the hinds give birth. At the appropriate time, the pregnant female leaves the herd. Directly after birth, the mother starts to lick her fawn dry. Immediately, the fawn tries to stand, but it can't quite manage it yet. Very soon, though, it can stand on four shaky legs. Now its mother removes the last damp patches. As soon as the fawn can walk, its mother leads it to a hiding place in the tall grass. It has almost no scent, so that it cannot be smelt out by predators. So as not to give away the hiding place, the mother drops by only every few hours to suckle her fawn. Soon, both of them will join the herd of stags for protection. The meanders, the narrow curves the river has carved out over millions of years, give this border valley a very special charm. The steeply rising rocks reflect the past. This is very old rock, which was once changed completely in the depths of the earth, then compressed and eventually folded up into a mountain. Unlike the Alps, which are still lifted by a few centimetres every year, these mountains have long since eroded. The forces of erosion have turned them into sand. These are the foundations of the mountains known as the Bohemian Massif. The river has dug more than a hundred metres into it. Again and again, huge formations of rock obstruct the river on its way to the Mach, thus forcing it to make the most bizarre detours. The rock's varying degrees of hardness have created meanders which almost meet in places.
At the narrowest section of the river, the meanders are only about 100 meters apart. In a couple of thousand years, the river will have broken this barrier too. There seem to be meanders even in the river itself. They are formed by light green plants, which now in midsummer produce bright white flowers. Ducks seem particularly partial to this greenery. If the water level is low, even deer and stags come to the river to feed on the water plants. Like all life by the river, the white water crowfoot suffers from the daily floods. Though it can handle the constant changes in water level, the cold waters from the artificial lake make the plants flower approximately a month later than in other rivers. Their seeds don't have time to ripen. So the plants can multiply only if parts of them washed away by the current can resettle in calmer and rockier sections of the river. In these calm bays or above the weirs which once supplied mills and today control the daily floods, the stems of floating water crowfoot grow to a height of six meters. In August, the river is covered in a layer of white blossoms. Just a few hundred meters away from the river, high up in the mountains, the national park seems completely different. Here, the remnants of the Pannonian climate can be felt most distinctly. This region is marked by wind, heat and drought. The heath was cultivated by humans a very long time ago, mainly as sheep pasture. These sparse meadows were grazed for centuries. This created a dry grass landscape, populated by animal and plant species completely different from those down in the valley. Just like the flower meadows along the river, the heath too has to be cultivated. Otherwise, bushes and shrubs would soon take over. The dry turf provides a hunting ground for an animal that looks like an alien. Green, twitchy and dangerous. Indeed, the praying mantis is one of the world's oldest insects and a skillful hunter. Once it has spotted its prey, there is almost no escape. Both victim and hunter have to move, this being the only way the praying mantis can recognize its prey and assess the range. Once a praying mantis has a grip on something, it will never let go. Its front legs have spines to penetrate its victim. Much has been written about the mating ritual of the praying mantis. Males seem to know the risks they run. Carefully, he approaches the female from behind. The female is well fed and ready to mate. The act can last for up to two hours. Often the female starts eating the male's head even while they're mating, but even decapitated he doesn't stop.
This mail's in luck, at least for the time being. But then the female's hunting instinct gains the upper hand. Although she has already eaten a number of grasshoppers, she also attacks the male. Once in his partner's clutches, his fate is sealed. It's early morning. Two reptiles have emerged from their hiding places above the river to bask in the sun. The Esculapian snake is still numb from the cold of the night. Even the green lizard, a swift and skillful climber, is slow to recover its senses. Now, during the mating season, these rare animals can be seen in all their glory. The first rule on this rock is whoever is first to warm up his body to working temperature will be quicker and therefore superior to his rival. Esculapian snakes are immigrants. There is a die-hard fairy tale that says that they were introduced here by the Romans, perhaps because of their Latin-sounding name. In actual fact, the snakes travelled north during long, warm periods entirely without human aid. However, the Romans kept Esculapian snakes as domestic animals to control rats. Even in the Tyre Valley, rodents are the snakes' preferred food. Yet this one seems to have its eye on something else. Sometimes the hunter becomes the hunted. Green lizards fight back when threatened by snakes. But this snake turns out to be a size too large. Eventually the lizard escapes and seeks shelter in a narrow crack in the rock. When the sun rises above Hardegg Mountain, the border valley reveals all its splendor. This is no place for spectacular natural displays, more discreet and hidden beauties. It's midsummer, but this is no ordinary day. It's August the 11th, 1999. Suddenly, towards noon, all the animals seem to stop their activities. The sky begins to darken. Within a few seconds, the land reflects a ghostly light. It's getting cooler, birds fall silent, and stags go to rest. After a few minutes, the spectacle is over. The eclipse disturbed the animals for only a couple of minutes. The young stags fight playfully, but soon the valley will reverberate with their father's bellowing. This is also the time for stag beetles to start their courtship. The ancient Germans considered them holy insects which could make the god of thunder hurl bolts of lightning from the sky. 
In the Middle Ages, their pincers were a popular defence against witchcraft, and the stag beetle's head in one's pocket promised luck and prosperity. Today, these belligerent animals are rare. High up in the branches of an oak tree, they start their mating rituals. The females are in great demand. In the still of the forest, the cracking of males fighting for females can be heard from far away. It would seem as though the male with the longest pincers should win. More often than not, the two will hold the same position for several days and mate up to a hundred times. During this time, the male will defend his female ferociously. There are about four times as many males as females. Although they are mating, the interest of other males is undiminished. It eventually turns out that size isn't all that counts. Size isn't all that counts. This applies to the whole of Tyrtal National Park. It's Austria's smallest national park. It's only about 40 kilometers from Freimdetsnaim on the Czech side. Austria's part of the park measures just 25 kilometers. And yet a priceless natural jewel has survived here. Just as this valley at the border was once a symbol of separation, it has now come to represent the mutual preservation of an irreplaceable natural heritage, defying all borders. Mm -hmm.